Shabbat Shalom. Is the Torah misogynistic or feministic? That's the question for today. Uh, hopefully you can understand why that would be on our mind, because you were paying careful atten attention to our Torah reading. Uh, what is the, uh, the primary section of Torah that we, uh, that we looked at this morning? Uh, yes, we looked at the Nazir and the priestly blessing, but there was another section right up at the beginning that um, took up an awful lot of time. What was it about? What is the protocol to address the, 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 the jealous concerns of a husband for his wife? So, what you're telling me is the Torah is misogynistic. Is that what you mean? I, I'm not trying to put you just specifically on spot. Sorry, sorry. I, I'm trying to say that this is, unfortunately, the way that people will often approach. They'll read a line, or they'll read a couple of lines, and then they will come to their conclusion. Ah, since it's perpetuating the patriarchy of the husband to be able to dominate his wife and force her to stand trial, whereas he is not susceptible to that same trial from her side. Therefore, clearly, this is hateful towards women, and it is misogynistic. Boom, boom, we've solved the question. We can all go home now or have kiddush. But it's not that simple, is it? Because... First of all, that's not exactly how that ceremony works, and we're going to come back to the details of it in just a minute. But let me point out the, the counter-hypothetical, which is that the Torah is, in fact, being feministic. That this is not a ceremony whereby the husband can persecute his wife, but this is, in fact, a ceremony that was introduced into a Bronze and Iron Age society which had, up till this point, given all authority to the husband to not only accuse his wife whenever he felt like, but to actually punish her however he felt like, regardless of the flimsiness of any evidence that he might be trying to bring. In fact, the husband didn't need evidence in other cultures prior to this time. If he suspected her of adultery, he could either divorce her without penalty or do away with her in more violent fashion. So when the Torah came along and said, wait, hold on, no, I understand that you're feeling jealous, but you can't just divorce her without having to uh, settle that appropriately, and you certainly can't do violence to her, and you can't handle this privately, you and your family going for an honor killing or some form of public shaming of her just because you've imagined that she has done something wrong. If, Mr. Husband, you really, really think that she has done something wrong, then you will bring her to the altar. And publicly, we will then see whether she has done something wrong, because God will decide. And look at the details of how God will decide. Right? Is, this, is she being put through some ordeal by fire? Is she being asked to walk across, across hot coals and see if they burn her feet, to hold a heated uh, piece of metal and see whether it burns her skin? Uh, things that were done in the Middle Ages, by the way. Is she being going through the ordeal of water in the classic sense? Throw her in the river, and if she floats, she's guilty, and if she sinks, she's innocent. Right? Good old witch trial things. No. What is actually going to happen to her when she stands at that altar? What is she actually made to drink? That word that comes up again and again in this uh, text, uh, and why the whole section is known as Sota, the, the text of the bitter waters. What, what actually is she drinking? Water with some dirt mixed in, and at least according to rabbinic interpretation, also some small text that had been erased from the scroll uh, into the, the water. The, the whole ordeal was written out, and then that was erased. This is why uh, Torah ink has to be water-soluble, by the way. Uh, in fact, as the rabbis pointed out, God wanted the husband and wife to reconcile so much that he allowed, in fact, demanded that his name be erased if it would bring that reconciliation. And that ultimately seems to be the purpose of this ritual in context, which is to say she is going to be forced to drink some slightly muddy water, silty water, which is no worse than what people were drinking back then on average, 
that has had a few non-toxic bits of ink added to it, and then God will decide. Which means this is not throw them in the river and watch them drown. This is not make them hold on to something hot. This is do something which is completely harmless, and only, only if she is actually guilty will there be a negative consequence for her. And when nine times out of 10, or 99 times out of 100, nothing happens to her, what is then the result? What's that? Yeah, they give an offering to God, and she is not condemned. Right? There is no stigma that will continue to attach to her. And as a matter of fact, I think we all can realize from social uh, norms, he would be made to look a fool. Imagine you have dragged your wife all the way to Jerusalem, and you have forced her to go through this huge ordeal, even while she was pleading her innocence. And once you get up there, it's like, aha, God's going to prove what a wicked woman you've been, even though I have no proof myself. And then she comes out without having had anything happen to her. Who was the idiot in this situation? And in fact, the rabbi said that any husband that went through with this ritual was considered as though he was possessed by a spirit of idiocy. That it was the husband that was considered the idiot, the fool, for doing something like this. So therefore, the Torah is feministic, right? It's a feminist document protecting the rights of women against unscrupulous husbands. Well, no. It's not that simple either. The same way that we cannot say that the Torah is misogynistic, we can also not say the Torah is feminist. Because the Torah was not dealing in those terms, and it is not easily dissected to be put into those categories. The concepts of both feminism and misogyny are not just whether it is bad for women or good for women. It is an actual ideology. And as such, the Torah, having not been written for either of those ideologies, is not going to reliably produce results that match, that mirror either ideology. And that makes people a little uncomfortable because we are used to reading things that have a singular point of view that fit within our modern conceptions of what different belief structures have. It turns out the Torah is not a modern document. I hate to break that to you. Uh, I know that uh, reading the English translation, especially the JPS, Jewish Publication Society translation, may fool you into thinking that it is a perfectly simple, easy to understand document, that we understand exactly what it's saying, and thus it sounds modern, and I can then apply my modern categories to it for analysis. It doesn't work like that. Let me point out a little bit of why it doesn't work like that, because with careful analysis, the entire structure of this ritual is, in fact, made even more different than you might have imagined. So on the surface, it sounds like when the husband gets a bee in his bonnet, he can drag his wife to the altar whenever he feels like it, right? Not so, say the rabbis. Read the text carefully. The redundancy, or seeming redundancy of the terms, and the careful use of different pronouns and the number of targets being used by each of the verbs and adjectives actually yields a very different result. That there is multi-steps going on here. The first step being that he has to actually warn his wife. That there was a warning. He had to go to her in front of witnesses and say, I want you to stay away from Mr. So-and-so. Well, already there is now a huge guardrail that perhaps didn't appear in our modern reading of the simple translation that we have been given, removing all of the incongruities that force us to actually recognize details that are not visible in a simple translation. So having warned her, she then has to actually violate the warning and be secluded with Mr. So-and-so. Not just he thinks that she was secluded with Mr. So-and-so. Again, there has to be testimony that she was isolated, hidden from view with Mr. So-and-so for long enough that something could happen, uh, which is a whole other discussion in the Talmud of exactly how long that can take at its minimum. So first of all, there was a public warning. Then there was actual testimony for the seclusion. And then, says the rabbis, reading the text carefully, at any point, she can simply say, you know what? I don't want to do this. 
divorce me. And then it's done. Or at any point, he can say, I don't want to do this. We're not, we're not going through with it. And they're reconciled and go on. And also say the rabbis at any point along the trip, if he is to violate what he should be doing with her, or <clears throat> for kids in the room, not what he should be doing with her, then also the ceremony is null and void. And in fact, once he takes this to the court in his local town, they will give him escorts to take him and his wife to the altar so that nothing untoward should happen. And then, by the time they are actually there, if it turns out that he, perhaps secretly, has also been having illicit affairs, it turns out God is not going to punish her. Because why would God punish her when he, as well, is violating these commandments? So it turns out that she could go to the altar, be guilty, drink the water, and nothing happens because he's as bad as she is. Or it could work out that she goes to the altar, drinks the water, nothing happens because she's innocent. It turns out that this is a really, really unpopular ceremony in the rabbinic literature, that this was a last-ditch effort to try and fix this issue in the family, where the husband had already been so upset that he had warned her and been willing to do so publicly, and that she had been so upset with him that she had been willing to be secluded with the person about which she had been warned, and that they had been willing to go through all the rigmarole to get there, that the rabbis basically said, this is so stupid. Why would people be jealous like this and behave like this? If you really, really don't want to be with her, divorce her. Pay the ketubah, right? You owe her that, but just divorce her. You don't need to go through with this, and you don't need to go through a ritual of such sanctity when really what you're looking for is a good divorce. But more than that, the rabbis eventually forbid the entire practice. During the times of the, uh, the Second Temple, the amount of immorality, to use a uh, $10 word, uh, the amount of immorality had exploded to such an extent that both men and women were already assumed to have at some point committed infidelity. And so everyone agreed this ritual was no longer operative because there was no actual righteous victim. There was no honest, innocent person that was likely to be standing at the altar. And now we're just making a mockery of the temple. Now we're just making a mockery of God. Now we are dragging God into the midst of a, a, a couple squabble the same way that unfortunately some families will drag their kids into the middle of a messy divorce. And you know what? God doesn't need that. If you're going to behave like this, don't drag it up to the altar and pretend like you're going to be righteous. It turns out that the Torah in this section is neither trying to be misogynistic, promoting the idea that women are somehow inferior or beholden to men, or that men should be allowed to treat women badly. Clearly, it's not promoting that. And like I said, compared to the societies in antiquity and really all the way up until the 20th century in even most European societies, it's actually providing more protection for women than you see elsewhere. But clearly the Torah is also not a feminist document. It is not fully, fully giving women equal rights. Unfortunately, it is still burdened by the social economic um, shackles of land ownership and, and the idea of patrilineal descent of inheritance, which is a whole nother conversation. So it is not fully recognizing women as being completely equal in all and every respects, definitely. But what the Torah is doing is trying to say that there is sanctity in a relationship and that that sanctity is protected by both sides. And if either side has decided that they wish to violate that sanctity, then they should simply leave the relationship first. And if they are unwilling to leave the relationship first and they are instead determined to commit acts of infidelity, then at the very least they could have the good grace to no longer pretend like this is a sacred relationship and don't drag God into it. Don't try and be holier than thou because you committed adultery twice, but your spouse committed it three times. That does not give you the high ground for your moral debate. Acting as though you are the aggrieved party and that God is on your side, when in fact you and your spouse may have both been behaving quite terribly, is unhelpful. Instead, simply have a civil discussion and decide that you need to go a separate way. The Torah was not trying to be misogynistic. It was not promoting modern concepts of feminism. 
It was trying to promote a concept of sanctity and a concept of there are alternatives in a relationship. It shouldn't come to bringing someone before an altar, but if it does, don't expect it to go your way. And in all honesty, for a situation like this, the Torah offers a much better solution to simply dissolve the relationship amicably, pay what is owed, and go separate ways. That is the ultimate peace that the Torah is trying to establish. Yes, it is true, Sota does try to provide a path for reconciliation, but it is, pardon the expression, a Hail Mary pass to try and hope that maybe this will fix it. Ultimately, the Torah prefers that we do the work not by dragging each other to the altar, but instead by doing the work each and every day in a relationship to reinforce the loving bond, to reinforce the respectful um, activities that we have towards one another, to make sure that we treat each other with dignity and humanity that we each deserve. This is not meant to be the norm, and in its aberration, we are meant to learn to do better. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>